Thank you. I have been saying for many years, and particularly post Ross Common, that it's really important that we don't anticipate that the Child and Family Agency can do this work on their own. While I've audited hundreds of cases and find practice issues that need to be addressed at all levels of the organisation and service, I've also been saying for years that there needs to be this kind of conversation between all of the key players, the guardians, the court service. I'm delighted that Judge McGrath is here today because we need to have a mechanism for having conversations with judges and with family law solicitors. And we also need to talk to the departments because if we're going to tackle neglect effectively in Ireland, we're going to have to have fundamental legislative change. So I'm seeing today as the start of that conversation and hands off, hats off to Tygala for actually taking the step and bringing us all together today. The truth is there are thousands and thousands of children in Ireland who are chronically neglected and collectively we have failed those children. So my challenge for you today is how about we collectively try to do something that makes it better for those children. So who here wants to step up and improve the lives of neglected children? I need to see every hand. That's better. Okay, and who here is preferred to step out of your comfort zone in order to do things differently and more effectively? I still, still need 100% hands here, folks. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm stepping out of my comfort zone today in a couple of ways. This is largely because I have children in their early 30s that keep saying, Mommy, are you still using PowerPoint? Da, 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 da. So two things. One is um, you have a URL there that allows you to um, log on to a website called Present um, on your smartphone, your laptop, your tablet or whatever. And you can actually download this presentation and you can make your own notes on your device as you go along and you can also type in questions to me. Now, I'm not going to answer them while I'm talking but I will get back to you if you send me questions. So what we're trying to do and what Eugene and Tygala are trying to do is identify ways that we can promote continuing professional development in different ways. And us old people have to be able to talk to all you millennials out there in language and on devices that you understand. So please have a go uh, at logging into that and let me know what you think of it because it's something that I'm trying to determine whether I use on an ongoing basis. The second thing is a year, maybe 18 months ago, I wrote an e-book called Tackling Childhood Neglect, which has had very, very good feedback. And it includes lots of exercises with, which tries to connect you to what it's like to be a neglected child so that we get in touch with what real life is like for those youngsters. And social workers said to me, that's great, but we don't get an awful lot of time to read so could you ever make it like an audio program so we could listen to it in the car or while we're walking the dog or whatever? So I've done the audio program. Um, everybody who's at the conference can have it for half price when it's ready. But in the meantime, because I don't have anything for you today, if you email me and I've got sign-up sheets at the back or on that platform, I'll make sure that you get the first couple of chapters free. If I do that for you, will you give me feedback on it? Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Helen set me up. She said I was going to tell you how to sort it. Okay, well, what I'm going to tell you is what doesn't work and give you some examples of what does work. And I want you to, to work with me on this because I am not really going to tell you anything today that you don't know. But what I want to do is that together, hopefully, our outcome will be for this session and for the rest of the day, because I'm really excited about the afternoon, the, the presentations later today and this afternoon, coming at this from all different ways and looking at how neglect impacts on all aspects of a child's life. So I really want us to get the consequences. Helen gave us a fascinating and very, very comprehensive run through all the different aspects of neglect and how it impacts on children and why. But I want us to really get that at an empathic level of what it's like being a neglected child, an emotionally neglected child, a child who's not even important enough 
to be fed on a regular basis, to have clean clothes and to be given a cuddle when they need it. I want us to stop doing what doesn't work. Guys, I'm going to talk about Einstein's theory in a minute. We've got to stop doing what doesn't work and we've got to do more of what does work. And I'm going to give you some examples of what does work. And I know that there are huge numbers of examples in this room of what works, and particularly Katrina, that we're getting so much learning from um, the, the PPFS programme in May about what works when we can really connect with these parents and get inside their model of the world. And I want to identify some of the blocks and limiting beliefs that hold us back. And one of the big ones, Judge, is that well, we're not going to take this case to court because judges don't give care orders for neglect. So very often we wait until something else happens. And Helen said it's not so much that these families get to a crisis, it's that they lumber along but the care of the child never gets any better. And the crisis sometimes happens when there's a physical injury to a child or there's a really traumatic accident. You know, the child pulls down, um, the case I was dealing with, the child pulls down daddy's weight bench on top of it and gets a really severe head injury and then we look at the whole family and realise that the neglect and has been chronic for years and the level of care has been really, really poor. So we have to get over some of those limiting beliefs and some of those limiting beliefs are that we are ineffective in dealing with these cases. We can, we can be very effective, we just have to fight, figure out what that is. But most of all, I want us to commit to doing it differently. So Einstein said, his definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again the same way and expecting a different result. Whenever you do a chronology of long-term um, neglect cases, do you recognise that? Don't you get that pattern of, oh my God, look at that, we've done that and that and that and that and we've done, been doing it for years and nothing changed for these youngsters. And Jim Rowan, who is one of the all-time great and personal development coaches in America, and he trained Tony Robbins, said, neglect starts as an illness and it becomes a disease. Now he was talking about the neglect of those everyday habits, like taking a walk around the block, or for a social worker, writing up your notes, returning those phone calls. But it actually is so such a relevant analogy for child neglect because you can treat an illness. If you get in early while neglect is small, and um, you can treat it when it's like an illness. But the problem is that a disease is all pervasive. And when neglect goes on for long enough with these families, it impacts on every single aspect of a child's life. And it becomes really difficult to make a difference. What is neglect? Well, Helen gave us some examples, but I want to hear from you at this stage. What is neglect? What does it mean to you? So just shout out. What is neglect? Don't be shy. I know a whole lot of people in this room, so I'll start picking on you in a minute. What is neglect? It's not dirty and happy anymore. It's not dirty and happy, absolutely. So what else is neglect? Not going to appointments, not looking after children's health needs. Yeah, what else is neglect? No curtains, because that means no privacy. Yeah, yeah. What else do you mean by no curtains? Why is that important? It's that type of house that's cold floors, no curtains. Yeah. Always something in the sink. Bins overflowing. Okay, do you hear this? Bins overflowing, no curtains, hard floors, cold. Miserable. Yeah, miserable. Okay. So in our definition, children's first definition of neglect is an omission of care which results in a child suffering significant harm. And harm significant whenever it severely impacts on a child's development. That's a horrendous definition. Why should children have to suffer severely before we actually think that that has met the threshold of an abuse or maltreatment definition? But as Helen said, we don't know whether to define these cases as welfare or protection. And that's why we're not quite sure sometimes when they come in the front door of duty teams, etc., of how we're actually going to deal with them. And in the face of situations that come in that more clearly evidence abuse, then these cases can get knocked back. But just actually, just before we leave that, what's very interesting, 
was, and again, Helen referred to it, that sometimes we see it more as something that the parent can't do anything about. But when neglect becomes chronic, and when the families we're working with totally resist all of our attempts to help them parent their child more effectively, then it becomes much more deliberate. Would you all agree that in some of the cases you're dealing with that the neglect is not unconscious, it is deliberate? Yes. Yeah. And men, do you know that many, many of the states in the US at the moment are actually including that in their definition of neglect? Deliberate and ongoing failure to meet a child's basic needs. So I, I want us to get past that idea that it's, it's, it's just an omission. Sometimes people commission neglect and they actively neglect their children. Why do we need to focus on child neglect? This is the question again. Absolutely, because it's intergenerational and if we can intervene now, we can stop this becoming reality for the next generation of children. Thank you. Why else do we need to focus on neglect? Oh great, you're all talking now. Because it's a horrific reality for so many children. Absolutely, thank you. Why else? Absolutely, because the everyday ongoing effect is cumulatively so harmful. Thank you for that. Okay, as Helen said, it's the most commonly reported form of child maltreatment in all developed countries. The UK and Ireland, the United States and Canada, Australia. Do you know there's a report of child neglect in America every seven seconds? That's how prevalent it is. It also, as Helen says, it happens in families of all sizes. And here's the important thing for us to get as we become a very more and more multicultural society in Ireland. It happens in all cultures. And sometimes it happens differently. So we have to understand those cultural variations and be able to address them. And we also have to help people understand, well, that may work in your culture, but here's how we do it in Ireland. And those can be real challenges for us as well. And then, as we've already said, the consequences for jailed children are just so devastating. And they're not just devastating at individual family level. They're devastating for communities. We know that there are whole pockets um, you know, in, in Dublin, in Waterford, in different, com different areas around the country where the community is um, plagued by antisocial behaviour, where there is just that sense of deprivation and hopelessness. And it's absolutely devastating for us as a nation, because look at the amount of money that we're spending trying to redress the consequences. Um, I looked at 100 cases of neglect across Ireland in Roscommon, Waterford and Dublin, post Roscommon. And again, these were the kind of issues that Helen mentioned. In, this was a sample of 96 families. 56 of the 96 had significant alcohol misuse issues. 26 out of 96 drug, drug misuse was an issue. Now, that has changed dramatically in the last number of years. Very significant in just a small period how that has changed so much. Domestic violence in 48, about half of the sample. And then, of course, as Helen also said, when you add mental health challenges, you get the toxic triangle of abuse, uh, violence, and mental health. What was really interesting in this is findings from a population of families that I looked at just last year um, in the Dublin area. And huge issues around homelessness. A lot of these families were in temporary accommodation. Um, huge issues about family mobility, moving around, being difficult to, to kind of catch up with them. The violence, the domestic violence had become off the scale in so many of these families. And it wasn't just situations where men were seriously abusing women. The female partners were equally violent. So it was like an absolute battle 
physical battle between both parties on a regular basis that very often escalated out into the street and for which the guards were called. Now imagine being a young child in that situation where your parents are hammering the daylights out of each other on a regular basis. How scary is that? Or you're lying in bed at night and you're hearing um, all the violence going on downstairs, either verbal violence or things being thrown, things being broken um, and mommy crying and daddy screaming and regularly people leaving the home that night and coming back the next day. The resistance to agency involvement I felt had become even more extreme than it had been three or four years before in the sample I was looking at then. And the drug abuse was chronic. People on long-term methadone programs. Now, methadone was supposed to be a way of getting people off heroin and getting them drug-free. We have grannies who are foster carers who've been on methadone programs for 20 years. They're permanently living their life in an altered state. You know, we, we just, there's things here that we need to be grappling with on a much more systemic level. So what's the impact on children? Well, Helen's already told us a lot about that and I'm gonna go through it really quickly. I just want you to get that these children's lives are miserable. The day-to-day -day life in these families where you don't know from one minute to the next what the situation is going to be, where mommy is um, huggy and, and warm one day and then detached the next, where people are emotionally available at some parts of the day, not others, when important people in your lives are there today and gone tomorrow, where you don't know if you're going to be fed, you don't know if you're going to go to school, and you don't know who's sleeping in your house tonight and what the consequences of that will be for you. These kids have a miserable day-to-day -day life. And we know that, as I'm not going to go through it's per, very poor physical and emotional development for all sorts of reasons. Um, and I think the other bit is, get everything from children who are neglected that aren't really fed at all to the levels of obesity now which are absolutely enormous report in the uk two days ago one in ten children under five in poorer families and i think they were classifying that families that were either on benefits or low income earning families were likely to be obese by the age of by the by the age of five one in ten children under five and, and we know um, how many of our families are just fed on, on um, takeaway food and whatever. And we know how expensive a way that is, so the money runs out at the end of the week. But they don't get a chance in school. Their education is disrupted. They're not, um, they don't fit into school because they're not there long enough. And then their self-esteem gets so damaged at such an early age. And we're going to be hearing later on from other speakers just how your psyche gets damaged when you get neglected at that level. And they're also much more accident prone. And they're more vulnerable to abuse just because there are very often no boundaries within these homes. The longer term impact we know is that very soon these troubled children become troublesome adolescents. And they're socially isolated, they're stigmatised. And they have very poor coping strategies. I'm working with a number of you at the moment, um, looking at some aspects of, of providing therapeutic inputs into special care. And many of these children, Paul, will have had very neglected backgrounds, characterised by some of the kinds of situations that I'm talking about here. They're at much higher risk of self-harm. They either turn the anger outwards and get into trouble in the community through violent crime, or they turn it inwards and that's when they self-harm. And they're at much higher risk of alcohol and drug misuse because that's what they know. They also, we're seeing so many of these kids transition from special care to detention because it's so much easier for them to get involved in criminal activities. And I also think sometimes these youngsters are so vulnerable that they just come to the attention um, of the police and the guards more often than other children. They've just generally got reduced life prospects, reduced job prospects, and then as we've acknowledged already, they're the next parent, next generation of parents who only repeat what they know. So that's why it's so important. And I love the title of this conference, Breaking the Cycle. We've got to break the cycle. <coughs> so what doesn't work? Well, what doesn't work is not, not acknowledging early enough that there are challenges within situations. So when 
In my experience, by the time schools and public health nurses and others actually report, cert, report cases to social work departments, um, they've actually been trying to do something themselves over a period of time. And actually, Sarah was just working recently um, trying to inc encourage a headmistress to make reports in situations where um, they, they hadn't reported their concerns early enough. So we get both sides of it, but when, when they do actually lift the phone to social work departments, we have to take that seriously. Assessments, you know, I Part of the challenge is nowadays that people are coming straight in, social workers are coming straight into care teams, never having served their time in duty. So if a situation comes up in a family where um, there's a child in care and another child at home, these social workers might never have done an initial assessment because they've never been on a duty team. So we've got to work through some of those challenges around making sure that everybody, it's bread and butter work of a social worker to be able to do an assessment. And an assessment doesn't need to take a whole pile of time. But you just have to know that there's three problems you're looking at, and we all know what they are. It's the child itself, the parent, and the external kind of more extended family situations. And, you know, there's a limited amount you have to look at, and you have to pull it together really quickly so that you can make a decision about what you need to do to make things better. There's a huge over-reliance on family support, and I think that's got better over time. But typically these families, we put in a family support worker and expected them to work magic. You know, and from a social work point of view, we kind of felt family support worker would hold it all together. And as long as there was somebody in there making the child food on a couple of days a week and teaching mom how to do things, we just kind of held our breath and hoped and prayed that it would get better. But the problem is if mom doesn't learn anything or commit to improving her childcare in those those sessions, whatever, then there's no point in us just having the family support worker in forever. With one exception, and there was one case I looked at recently, and the family support worker had been in for six years and actually came to the conclusion, if two sessions a week over six years actually kept these children at home, then probably then that was it was worth it. The challenge is always when the, when the children become older and more challenging, that mum won't be able to hold it together at that point. And we all know that if the kids are coming into care really late, it's harder. But for now, actually the family support worker was holding it together. And I think what doesn't work is just trying all different ways that haven't been evaluated. We need to get a few models that work with families and actually practice those consistently and evaluate them. And I think then what doesn't work is not being clear when we've exhausted family support and we really are at the threshold of child protection and we need to, need to push it up a notch. What else doesn't work? And this is a message for everybody and particularly um, family law solicitors out there and, and um, the courts. Um, Prioritising parents' rights over children's rights. Now, the referendum helped. But children are rights holders in their own regard. Given the UN Convention and whatnot, children are entitled to have their basic needs met. And when that's not the case, we have to be making sure that however empathetic we are towards parents, that we have to make sure that children's rights are addressed. Um, not engaging with and listening to children, we have to get better at talking directly to children and creating opportunities for them to tell us what life is really like for them. What doesn't work is when we don't keep the focus on children's needs, and Helen referred to this already, sometimes we get over obsessed with the context and help and support the parents and creating a better environment like finding the housing or getting mom into or getting dad into a, a drug program. The, none of that, the, the purpose of all of that from our point of view is to improve children's circumstances. So when we don't see the impact on th making things better for children, then you know, we need to have a different model. The start again syndrome. We start again because there's what? A new child? We start again because there's a new partner. We start again because there's a new social worker. We start again because there's a new team leader. And everybody thinks that, you know, this small change in circumstance is going to make things different, and it doesn't. And that's where you get the drift. And then sometimes we just stop because we run out of ideas and we close the case because we can't think of anything else. But nothing really changed for the children. And also these kids come on and off the child protection system, sometimes with no noticeable improvement. What else doesn't work? 
Long-term voluntary care doesn't work. We bring kids in and we, heave, we breathe a huge sigh of relief because now they're in care. And we make a deal with the parents about why they're in care and how long they're going to be in care. And then we get this tenuous kind of skirting around the issues where um, mum's able to say or dad's able to say. And sometimes mum and dad aren't even living together, but they both have a say. Um, because of guardianship or whatever but there's this constant renegotiation if you don't do this I'm going to bring those children home again and we haven't actually from the children's point of view given them the certainty they need when children come into voluntary care there should be an immediate attempt to determine what would rehabilitation look like what needs to happen because our primary effort should be to get these children back home the problem is by the time they actually come into care voluntary or otherwise we've usually exhausted everything and we've no energy left to try and get a rehabilitative plan if that's the case we have to be honest about it and we have to go for the care order Lengthy legal proceedings. Okay, so I'm a lay magistrate in the north and we hear care order applications in a day. So when I hear 20 days for care order applications, I just don't get why that needs to be the case. And that can be so damaging. It's damaging in terms of the impact on the energy of everybody involved. It can be damaging to the relationship because the social worker is going to have to work with the parents going forward. So I would really like to question why legal proceedings need to be so so lengthy and so adversarial. You know, we need to get towards a much more collaborative approach where we're all working together in the best interest of children. Again, short-term care orders can create massive uncertainty for children. You know, again, with chronic neglect cases, we've very often exhausted all of the options. So if the children have come into care at that stage, it should be something to give them enough long-term certainty that they can attach to foster carers and move on. Okay. And then following on from that, high levels of inappropriate contact and access, we have to determine whose needs are we meeting by contact and access. And if it's the parents and it's very, very unsettling and disturbing and distressing for the children, and the children are telling us by their behaviour as well as their words that it's very distressing for them, then we need to look at that. And also, it, again, it disrupts the potential for attachment to the new um, carers. I want to show you a case example. This is one of my very first cases as social worker in 1978, which just shows you how old I am. This was a case in Belfast. It had been known to the agency for years by the time I was allocated the case. The house was absolutely filthy. It was in an area of Belfast called the Bog Meadows. It's where the motorway goes now at Boucher Road. There was no heat in the house. There was one of those new glass-fronted glass -fronted fires that you had to buy a certain type of coal for. But this mummy had bashed in the glass front and burnt whatever she had to burn. And it was totally ineffective. So most of the time the house was really cold. The children were dirty and smelly. Their school attendance was dreadful, but the EWO and I went every single day between us to get those children to school. And we achieved three days out of five most weeks. And we wanted them to go to school because we wanted them out of that terrible house. We wanted them engaged in the education system. We wanted them to have the socialization of going to school. And we also wanted them to get a hot dinner. So if we got them to school, we ticked all those boxes. There was absolutely no stimulation within the home. The supervision was dreadful. The kids ran the streets at night in the dark and the wee one was constantly falling over and banging into things and having bruises and whatever. And those children eventually, not on my watch, I have to say I handed it over to somebody else, um, um, those children were eventually admitted to care. This case was reported in the Belfast Telegraph three months ago. It had been known for years. The case had been open and closed multiple times. The five and six year old were going to school infrequently and when they went they were still wearing nappies at five and six to school. Needless to say they were dirty and smelly and the other children didn't want to sit beside them and the teachers reported multiple times how concerned they were. The house was filthy, there were dog feces everywhere. The children's toenails were so long that they curled right under their feet and stuck into the underside of their toes so that they couldn't walk without pain. This is 2016. 
The stimulation was dreadful and they were eventually admitted to care. Why did it get to the Telegraph? The mother appealed the district judge's decision on the care order and it went to the High Court and the High Court judge made a judgment which was reported in the Telegraph. And I've just been asked to undertake the case management review in that case. Those two cases were 38 years apart. Do you see what I mean about not doing what doesn't work? That raises all sorts of governance issues about the role for senior managers because in my experience the thresholds are generally far too high for most levels. Too high for cases being allocated to social workers, that's also a resource issue. Too high for child protection conferences and getting into the system. Way too high for bringing these children out of these circumstances where the, it's, the culture is so endemic that our best efforts aren't going to change it. I've looked at huge numbers of cases where the amount of work that went in by the social work department, the family support service, the um, Focus Ireland and some of the housing developments, whatever, the amount of work that went in by all the other players was enormous. But the amount of work being put in by the parents was really, really small and not enough to make change. Thresholds are too high for legal intervention and then I think when we do get to court that sometimes the thresholds for care orders are too high. Now social workers say we can't go to court because we're not going to get an order. That's not your decision. If you think it's met the threshold, get the case to court. If every case was going to be awarded a care order, why would we need judges? You know, that's why we bring cases to court, so we get that other look at it. And we can't make that decision at our level that we're not going to go because we're mind readers and we don't think the judge is going to award the order. And then we've got to look at, at all of our about reducing contracts. So what does work? Really good assessments at the very beginning, as quickly as possible, working effectively with both parents where they exist in a family. Helen's already said that. We need to work with fathers as well as mothers. Smart plans, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timelined. And whenever they don't, we don't get those plans achieved, we don't just rehearse them in the next child protection plan, we do something different. We need early cognitive assessments. We need to know what mum or dad or the carer, sometimes it's, it's a granny or whatever, but we need to know the cognitive ability of the person who's the main carer. And we also need, and when we talk about parenting capacity assessments, for me there's two aspects to that. One is the cognitive piece, what is the parent capable of? The second is the motivational piece, what is the parent willing to do? And you need to have both those aspects. And you need regular and frequent reviews. What else works? Well, you need to be really clear with parents what you expect of them. And sometimes, you know, you know that bit about communication is not what's transmitted, it's what's received. And when I'm doing audits and you actually talk directly to children and young people, or you talk directly to parents, then sometimes they just didn't get the bit that what is it exactly you want them to do. And sometimes we ask too much of them. So giving them 15 things to do is not going to work. A principal social worker at a, a conference in um, Derry a couple, of, uh, a couple of years ago stood up and he said, um, he was chairing a case conference and the mum said, now before you ask me why I didn't get that fifth thing done, I want you to know I had five things to do and have done four of them. That social worker had three things to do and she hasn't done any of them. So before you start on me, and he, and, and he said it was very chastening for him. But it was great that the parent was able to speak up, but she had also engaged and she was moving on. But it's really important. Three to four things is probably as much as we can expect them to do. And review early through the core group so that we know what's going on. And from our point of view, follow through on services. If we've said, well, we're going to get an OT assessment, well, make sure we get it. Sometimes it's us that holds up the plan because we haven't been able to deliver against our promises. Measure progress. What happened? What improved? What didn't? What else can we try? And fam I love family welfare conferences because they do bring in all the potential supporters. And the reason most of them go wrong is because everybody's very enthusiastic and optimistic at that page and we don't review them early enough. And something happens in these families two weeks down the road and we need to make sure that we've corrected. What else works? Take the 
concerns of other professionals seriously. Believe it or not, it's still hard for people to refer to the child and family agency. So if they do, acknowledge it. And then the other bit is see the chronicity. And the best way to do that is make sure you have a social history and do a chronology. Now, whenever I go to review files, sometimes they wheel them in in trolleys. And one case might be multiple trolleys where it's like up to 20 files. You have to make sure that all the relevant information gets carried forward into the working file. And one of the ways of doing that is put all the reports and assessments in one maybe ring binder and carry that forward with the file. But we also have to get rid of the ridiculous amount of paperwork that you all have to do, which is just crippling and which is like burning down the the um, rainforest. It's, the, the whole bit about having a separate file for each child is fundamentally sound, but you don't have to photocopy every single page onto that file. The paperwork at the moment is absolutely unmanageable. So make sure that you do your chronology so that you see the patterns that emerge. And identify supports early. And again, one of the best ways to do that is just by doing a simple genogram. So when you look at that, you see that there are potentially all sorts of aunts and uncles, parents and grandparents who might be able to support this family. What else works? Just call time. When you've done everything you can possibly do and nothing's changed, name it and move on. Apply the thresholds consistently. Get, get informed, take informed legal action. That requires everybody to pull all their assessments together. Don't get to court and wait for the judge to instruct you to go and get assessments done for this, that and the other thing. You know what assessments are going to be required and get those stacked up in advance. And know what you want before you commission specialists. Tell them exactly what you want. And then confident oral evidence. And I think one of the other issues is that courts need to treat um, social workers, um, uh, guardians, you get treated with much more respect generally. Courts need to treat social workers with respect as well. And then we need judicial judgments that are child-centred and not, not um, particularly concerned with, um, I think the focus very often is on well, what else can we try before we take these children away, these poor parents, what else can we try? We have to keep our focus on what's best for the children. Um, in your packs, there are two case studies. I'm not going to have time to go through them just now, but just, but just maybe the first one. It was a because it was such a rare occasion. It was a GP referral. Okay, so the doctor referred this family, and it was a middle class family. And mother had been driving with the children in the back of the car. The children were so terrified that they called their auntie, and mum was admitted for treatment. The dad was. Um, uh, this had been going on for eight years. So dad at this stage had been um, counselled by the GP that he needed to do something different. The social worker did investigative interviews with every single child and they were all under 10. Um, and the children talked about how fearful they were and the fact that mummy not only drove with them in the car but that she threatened them in all kinds of ways to keep quiet, etc. So it was a very fearful kind of environment. But the Family Welfare Conference involved all of Mum's family and agreed that she would stay out of the home, she would attend addiction services. She gave consent for people to share information so that her addiction services could talk to the social workers. Father agreed to counselling for all of the children and also there were, um, there were supervised visits. The key factor in that case was that the social worker was really familiar with research on collusion and resistance in alcohol abusing families and just kept a really great focus on the needs of the children. Second one was a great example of how Marty Mayo worked really effectively with a neglecting family um, with really good outcomes. So just to finish up, I think what we're finding here in Ireland is no different from the rest of the UK because the concerns and challenges identified in serious case reviews are very similar. Resistant and unwilling parents, um, workers not engaging dads, issues about building trust with families, collusion with parents, overcoming the rule of optimism um, and making sure that we audit our cases on a regular basis. From, from a governmental point of view, we need to do something more about retaining social workers and training and mentoring and supervising them and supporting them. We need to um, get better interfaces, and referred to this already, between statutory services and the courts, and I hope today is the start of that conversation. 
We also need specialist family courts and we need trained judges who are specialising in this work. Um, no surprises in terms of the training and mentoring agenda. And I think just the key recommendations is we need to get that interdepartmental discussion. In the North, we have the Children Order Advisory Committee, which is chaired by the High Court judge in the Family Court and has representatives of the equivalent to the Child and Family Agency, the Guardian and Lydum Agency, Family Law Solicitors. And it's not about influencing judges. Um, decision making in individual cases, it's about creating the, the systemic context within which the debate can take place. We also need to create international research, we need to research successful um, approaches with, with children and families. And I think we also, and this is something we talked about within TUSLA, we need to look at the outcome of unsuccessful care order applications and track those. And if we're convinced that we still need the care order, go back six months later with more evidence. But we have to look at what happened next. Some of them inevitably will have done okay, but some of them won't. So we need to know what made the difference. And finally, I just want to say that was major challenge to all of you, but mastery is about not defending, not protecting, about getting the learning and correcting. And correction is essential to power and mastery. So my challenge for all of you is make a decision today to do something different. Step up for neglected children in Ireland and don't just come from your head. Come up from an adult, from a feeling level as well. Come from your heart when we're working with these children. And um, if you want copies of the first two chapters of the audio programme, there's sign-up sheets or you can email me at lynn at lynnpayton.com or you can go to the website and download, I think from tomorrow, um, download those two chapters. So thank you very much for your time. Can I just take a stock take before we go? Who's ready to step up for neglected children? Okay, thank you very much.